Hello and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be doing the topic of sampling and how it applies to our Fourier analysis that we're going to be moving towards respect to the later lectures. So the continuous time Fourier transform, as we saw in the last lecture, allows us to move from a time domain signal to the spectrum of its signal, which is basically the frequency domain representation of, its sig of itself. Now, the continuous time Fourier transform that we use in order to achieve this, it can't be evaluated numerically as yet. So this exists in continuous time, but we need to get this into discretized time. And as of such, any DSP process, this requires for it to be in a discretized form as of such being a sequence of numbers. So the questions we need to ask are how do we move from x of t to x of n, meaning how we move from continuous time to discretized time, if there are any restrictions, and then how can we evaluate that continuous time Fourier transform on x of n. And this is where sampling comes into play. Now if we sample a random sinusoidal sequence here, we can basically see it's a series of stem stems indicating the magnitude at which the sample was taken. So this would be sample 1, sample 2, sample 3, sample 4, sample 5 and so forth. And the spacing in between each two samples here is known as the sample time. So this is also referred to as the sample period or the sample interval. If we watch the example here being a stock price, we can basically see that the sample period is going to be fixed and this actually makes it a lot easier to understand. And from just observing the general trend, the lowest price was at week 4 and the highest price was at week 9. Now, two things to note is that the sampling period is going to be the time between two samples. The sampling time is the time taken for a sample. So remember in real life scenarios the impulse does not exist, it needs to be a very small rectangular window. So the width of this small rectangular window here for the sample is referred to as the sampling time, but the time between two samples is referred to as the sampling period. So this is also another example showing that samples are taken and on the x-axis here refers to which sample it is so this will be the 10th sample the 11th sample the 12th sample and so forth and the sample period uh, tends to be like five minutes and so forth regarding this so what happens if there's a change between two samples if that happens is that what that means is that we may miss some sort of information that might be crucial or important to observing the graph that we are trying to analyze. And as of such, because we miss this while sampling, it means that when we do the approximation for the actual graph, we don't see this drop here. It just thinks like it's a flat line here, so we don't observe this change. So non-periodic snapshots mean that if we don't go within a certain period, i.e. if the sampling period is not constant, it's possible to miss information. And even if the sampling period is constant, it's still also possible to miss information, but it makes interpreting the information a lot easier because the space in between two samples is constant. Now, in order to make sure that we don't miss this type of information, like in between two samples, the important point here is that we need to know what is the sampling frequency to make sure we are accurately sampling the signal to get an accurate representation from continuous time to discretized time. So, this brings us back to how do we obtain samples of a signal and this refers to how we could have had the x of n signal here being a series of weighted impulses and we can use the convolution sum equation that we saw from all the way back in like lectures 1 and lecture 2 
to actually achieve the sampling process. So if we took a random continuous time arbitrary signal here and we multiplied it by an impulse strain, what this does is that the impulses here, if they are all magnitude 1, will automatically sift out each of these values here accordingly for each time the impulse occurs. So as such we obtain the series of weighted impulses and to represent this mathematically, it will be delta of t minus nt, to be representing that the weighted impulses are shifted towards the left or right accordingly. And then the summation of all these impulses multiplied by the original time signal, if we note this as x of t, will give us a sample signal denoted as y n of t. So an example here is, let's say if we decided to multiply this sinusoid here by our sample signal here accordingly, we basically extract the point wherever we had a magnitude of 1, but wherever it was magnitude of 0, it's just going to be 0. So, if we take the weighted impulse function here, noted at S n of t, and we try to find the CTFT of this, using the x of omega equation, and we try to transform it into S omega, what happens here is that from moving from S of t here, being a series of weighted impulses in time, being zero, first instance of t, the second instance of t, and the third instance of t, we now represent this in s omega being that will be zero, two pi divided by t, then four pi divided by t, then six pi divided by t, and so forth. So the spacing in between each one of these impulses here in the frequency domain is going to be two pi k on t, where k represents the numerical index as an integer. So as such, the frequency domain representation is a series of impulses spaced 1 on t, or f of s being the sampling frequency, apart. The convolution property also holds true such that the multiplication in the time domain means there's a convolution in the frequency domain and vice versa. Now, the implication of this is that convolution between two signals in discretized time can only be done if this modulation property here is observed, given by the following equation underneath. If this property is not observed, convolution cannot be done regarding discretized time accordingly. So let's say we had a random arbitrary frequency domain signal, being x of f here, and we convolute it for our impulse function in the frequency domain. In this case, it's going to be delta f minus f naught. When we do this, instead of it sampling, it actually replicates. So our y of f here being the convolved signal, it makes it such that when the signal is convolved with an impulse in the frequency domain, the signal is repeated at the instance of each one of these impulses. Positive B and negative B here refers to as sidebands. So this is so positive B here is the upper sideband of the frequency signal, and negative B here is going to be the negative sideband or the lower sideband of the frequency signal. So as of such, if we have a huge set of impulses going down the line in the frequency domain and we convolve it with our x of c signal, and with our output here is going to be the x of s signal, this basically is just going to keep on repeating the x of c signal at each one of these impulses. The sampling frequency, or the digital frequency here, is denoted as omega s is equal to 2 pi on t. This phenomenon that we observe here is also referred to as spectrum replication. Now this looks all nice because we're observing a certain effect, but the effect can be changed if we started modifying the sampling frequency. So let's actually start observing what happens if we modify the sampling frequency accordingly. <laughs> 
So if omega s here decreases, the space in between each one of these spectrums that we observe is going to get closer. So the space in decreases. So as of such, as the space in decreases, we're going to have to observe what is the relationship between the sampling frequency and the sideband B. And we're going to observe this in the next few slides. So actually, let's think about this regards to if we had a sinusoid equation here being x equal to sine omega naught of t. The spectrum here is basically going to be centralize about the center frequency and we're going to have an upper sideband here being omega naught and a negative sideband here or lower sideband being minus omega naught. The spectrum for x sine omega naught of t here is going to be 2 omega naught because it's represented by this space in here. So if we said the center here was going to be zero. This part here is going to be omega naught, but this part here is also omega naught as well, despite the sign. So if we add the two together, we'll get two omega naught. Now let's take the spectrum of that same signal, but instead we're going to be sampling at four omega naught instead. So this means the signal is going to be repeated at every instance of four omega naught. However, whereas you may think that the spectrum of the signal is going to be greater, it actually isn't, because the spectrum just remains the same. Remember, the spectrum here is replicated because of this increased sampling frequency. But we don't care about the replications, we only care about the original signal. So any instance where it is one replication or the original signal, we just only care about the bandwidth or the spectrum of that signal. And in that case, it will always be the same as if we had had it from before. In this case, it's going to be two omega naught. Now this is nice because we're going up in sampling frequency and we're doing nice solid integers. But what happens if we decrease the sampling frequency or we decide to go with a decimal sampling frequency? So what occurs here instead when, when we try to replicate the spectrum using 1.5 omega naught, the original spectrum here, as we know, it's going to be 2 omega naught, being from positive omega naught and negative omega naught. But now we have these two red lines here representing our sampling frequency at 1.5 omega naught. And we're asking ourselves, what is this? This did not exist from before, and now it exists inside the spectrum of our signal. So what happens here when we start sampling at irregular frequencies is that we start introducing frequency components that were not part of the original spectrum. And these frequency components is what we refer to as alias. So this brings us forward to what we refer to as our sampling theorem. And the sampling theorem is also referred to as the Shannon sampling theorem or the Nyquist sampling theorem. And what it states is basically that any continuous time signal that you're trying to properly sample, you must always be such that you are twice that of the original frequency. So once you're more than twice that of the original frequency, so the sampling frequency needs to be twice that or more than twice that of the original frequency of the signal, the alias signature effect will not be observed in general. If it is less than that, you will tend to observe the alias in effect. So if we take our same sinusoid signal here and we sample it accordingly, in case one, our sampling frequency here is way greater than the original frequency of this signal here. Yeah? So we get nice spectrum replication accordingly, with our upper sideband, our lower sideband, and our centralized frequency here being around each one of the sampling frequency points. So the spectrum is replicated very nicely.
if we're actually at twice that of the original signal frequency here, so f of s is equal to 2 f of a, we also get our nice spectrum replication here as well. However, if we go less than that, meaning that the sampling frequency is less than twice that of the original signal frequency, we want to see this aliasing effect occur for each one of these instances where the signal just tends to be replicated for its spectrum. So if we cannot sample at the Nyquist rate, one way to mitigate this is using a bandpass filter. But however, in using the bandpass filter, this tends to truncate the signal as if we did a window on it. So we may get some of the important parts of the signal, but we lose some information in the process due to this improper sampling rate. The bandpass filter needs to be band limited to less than twice the sampling frequency in order to obtain this effect. So we need to pay attention to when using the bandpass filter, where it is going to be the most important parts of the information in the frequency domain that we must recover and where we actually can sacrifice or truncate accordingly. Now real world sampling means that we want to be using these small rectangular windows because a mathematical impulse does not exist in the real world. So these small rectangular windows or rectangular pulses are mathematically defined by this equation here in the pink box. <coughs> if we do the Fourier transform here of one of those rectangular pulses, we basically just get back our nice sync function. As we saw from the previous lecture where we did the sync on a rectangular window, so we're just basically just going to get back our nice sync function accordingly. If we do the Fourier transform of this rectangular pulse train, we also get back our sync spectrum here accordingly. But the impulse train here is going to be amplitude scaled by the sync function. And we also saw this in the last previous lecture with regards to the Fourier series. One thing to note is that the zeros that we observe here in this sync function are n on tau, since the sine function was pi tau on f regarding its content, and pi to, sine pi tau of f is equal to zero. And pi tau of f was equal to n pi, and the impulses are at n on divided by t. So the envelope of any impulse strain if we try to do the spectrum accordingly, is that we're going to get a sync function. And in sampling it, we'll get some magnitude scaling of the original frequency spectrum. So whereas the original spectrum here, given by the top graph, is represented by these one of these spectrum replications for where the rectangular pulses occur, when we actually apply the sync envelope here, this is actually what we observe as well. So we get some amplitude truncation accordingly. We still maintain the frequency content, but now the amplitudes here are truncated because of the sync envelope. So as tau increases, meaning tau being here, the sampling time, represented by the width of each one of these rectangular pulses, the sampling train tends to move a little bit more irregular, and we tend to get more signal attenuation as that sampling time approaches capital T, being our periodic time. So as the width of the, each one of these rectangular pulses increase in, we get more signal attenuation and we result in a more information loss. So it's kind of important to keep tau as small as possible. So for our sync envelope here, what we observe when we use it regards to our spectrum 
is that the zeros of the sync function and the period of the impulses tend to coincide. And in signal reconstructing, we need to know what is required for recovering the original continuous time signal. And we can actually look at the spectrum of the sample signal to achieve this. So if the spectrum is actually passed through an ideal low pass filter, represented by this rectangle here, all the replications are removed and we uh, remain with the original baseband spectrum being the original content of the signal. As of such, it is possible to recover the original continuous time signal by using the inverse Fourier transform accordingly. Now the practicality of this is that some operations are easily done in the frequency domain than in the time domain. And a prime example of this is the convolution that we just all observed. The inverse Fourier transform helps to obtain back the frequency signal and its time domain representation accordingly when this occurs. The impulse response of that ideal low pass filter is also a sync function. And you may want to ask. Why is this? The reason for this being is that the low pass filter, all because we also applied it like a rectangular window, it also contains those sync properties. And the response of this is that there's an infinite time response and the signal here is anti causal. Now, ideal low pass filter is not realizable in practice, it basically does not exist. We can get close to it, but it really does not exist in the real world. So one method to do signal reconstruction is that we start to ten, we start with a general data sequence and we will sample this with a sample whole circuit. So this sample whole circuit represents our small rectangular pulse trains that we observed in the previous slides. So each value is whole constant for the sampling interval and it basically what it refers to here is what we refer to as a staircase approximation of the original signal. And then we staircase interpolate in order to obtain back the re actual signal, what it should look like. So the spectrum of the reconstructing signal after staircase approximation is like if we were observing it from before in the previous slides, if we had the convolution effect, but we had the weighted impulse function or the series of impulses convolved with this rectangular pulse accordingly. And one thing to note here is that the impulse train period and the pulse width are going to be equal. So as of such, when we actually do apply it, and remember this is going to be a sync envelope, as we saw from the previous slides, the reconstructed signal will also be such that it applies like the same envelope that we observed in the previous slides before. Now, one thing to note is that because the sync envelope occurs and we had some amplitude truncation, the reconstructed signal is going to be have a slightly different frequency content from the original. And this is expected because we did an approximation. And each one of those baseband frequencies that we observe was attenuated by the sync envelope. Those silo frequencies referred to as the upper sideband and the lower sideband may also be included and sometimes you actually may wish to get rid of these so you may actually have to do an additional low pass filter in order to get rid of it. This particular type of reconstruction that we observed here is also referred to as a zero order whole reconstruction. And just like sampling, reconstruction of a signal is also an approximation. So because it's an approximation, you will never get back to the actual content of the signal. You can get close to it as possible, but you will never get back the actual full reconstruction. So as such, the, the low pass filter response, when it's compensated by that sync attenuation, the effect is such that Instead of this nice upward curve here, we get this downward curve here accordingly for the compensated low pass filter response.
So this brings us to the end of our sampling lecture. The next lecture that we're going to be doing is how we move from the continuous time Fourier transform to the discrete time Fourier transform.